Those nights felt really clear Or don't you Sound of thunder well, I wished I was a weatherman Stored away the last of the rain I saved it for a sunny day well, I have one thing left on my mind to say Send it on the radio waves 
Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Jan Dever, and I serve on the Board of Trustees in this community here at First Unitarian Society of Denver. Our welcome music this morning was performed by Progressive Bluegrass Mountain, Progressive, okay, I'm gonna get this, Progressive Bluegrass Band, Meadow Mountain, and they will be performing here at our sanctuary this coming Saturday at uh, the 8th at 7 p.m and tickets are available in our community room after the service or online at capitolhillconcerts.com. Whoever you are, whomever you love, whether you carry joy or sorrow in your heart, you are welcome here. All people of goodwill are warmly invited to join us on the great journey of the mind, the heart, and the spirit. I love that paragraph. If this is your first time with us today, please let the offering basket pass you by. Your presence here is enough, gift enough. We hope that you will join us after the service for coffee and conversation out in the back room. We would love to get to know you and answer any questions that you happen to have. Anyone can learn more about our congregation on our website. There you will find our weekly email blast with information about activities and the groups here at church. And on the first and third Sunday of the month, this being one of them, our offering is donated to an organization from the Denver community which has been chosen by our Faith in Action Committee. All cash and checks will be donated in full unless otherwise designated. We will learn more about the organization that was chosen for us today um, to receive our financial resources later in the service. For the next hour or so, please quiet your busy minds, mute your electronic devices, and enjoy the service. Welcome to everyone. Good morning. I'm Steve Brainerd. I'm a member of the Racial Justice Project here at First Unitarian. If you're a member, you know that we have undertaken a dialogue here on how this church might participate in work to repair the damages created by white supremacy culture, and particularly how we, First Unitarian, might develop an economic reparations fund for use within the Denver black community. This morning, we are very happy to welcome Lottie Lieb Dula, who will share with us her own heritage story as a white American and the conclusions she's drawn from her study of and reflections on that story. You can't do much research into matters of racial repair without bumping into Lottie. She has developed and made available to all of us for free what I regard as the single best resource for understanding the history of the call for reparations its economic and moral bases, and the forms it can take. Please find your way to reparationsforslavery.com, which is among the web links that were recently sent to everyone via email. There, you will find a graduate program in anti-racism. There are lectures and books and films and articles and workshops and connections to activist groups and questions and answers. It is phenomenal. It's accessible and beautifully organized and basically it's all Lottie's doing. Also, along with some First Unitarian members of whom we're very proud, uh, Julie Myers, David Alley, Betty Kuhner, Lottie has formed a giving circle of the Denver Foundation, the Reparations Circle Denver. This is a group devoted to pooling funds from white donors that can be used to begin rebuilding the institutions 
social structures and the trust of our black fellows. Following the service, we'll reconvene here in the sanctuary where we'll, we'll have a little time to ask Lottie additional questions and maybe exchange some ideas. So Lottie, even though it's gonna be a few minutes before you skip up here, thank you so much for being here. Good morning, First Unitarian. I'm Patrick Horton, also a member of the Racial Justice Project here at FUSD. On the wall in my kitchen by the coffee pot, where I see it every morning, hangs a calendar from the Equal Justice Initiative in Montgomery, Alabama, a calendar that I reference every morning. It narrates 365 egregious injustices to the black community from the inception of this country to present. Really, this is a small number taken as a whole. It reminds me of why I'm doing the work that I'm doing here at FUSD. It reminds me that I'm hopefully fulfilling what will become the eighth UU principle, a principle which states, we, the member congregations of the Unitarian Universalist Association, covenant to affirm and promote journeying towards spiritual wholeness by working to build a diverse, multicultural, beloved community by our actions that accountably dismantle racism and other oppressions in ourselves and in our institutions. But moreover, it reminds me that I'm working to fulfill our own covenant, which in part states, together, we will learn about white supremacy, culture to create an equitable congregation. We gather here today in an effort as a congregation to explore and examine how we might together fulfill these promises in the forms of black reparations. Thank you for joining us here today in this sanctuary or virtually, as we welcome Lottie, who will speak to this topic. I would also like to remind you once again that after this service, we'll take a short break in the community room for some coffee, about 15 minutes, and then, if you would like, reconvene back here in the sanctuary where Lottie will answer any questions that come to mind. So as you listen to her today, please keep those questions in mind. We hope you'll join us. Again, welcome. Wherever you are and whoever you are, you are welcome here. Please sing along with me, and as you sing, turn to a neighbor in front of or behind you or to your side and welcome them here with your voice. We are many, we are one, the light of the world is within you, sacred and worthy a place has been made for you welcome good morning uh erica is under the weather and was unable to be here to sing um the slide is correct we are uh playing alabama by john coltrane your order of service is not correct Announcing the change.
Sorry, sorry. All right, all right. Uh, so if you are old at, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. If you are young or young at heart, come up here. I'm sorry. I messed it up. I'm sorry. Come on up. Come on if you're young or young at heart, come up. Oh, man, I'm so sorry. Come on. Come on. Hurry up. I don't mean to rush you. So sorry. <laughs> sorry. Come on. Come on. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Oh, oh my gosh. Sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, excuse, excuse me. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Just sorry. Sorry. Let me just. Sorry, guys. Sorry. 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 Excuse me. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Sorry. I, I missed you over here. I'm so sorry. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Sorry. Whew. Sorry. Whew. Do you ever notice how when you say something over and over again, it kind of loses its meaning? Oh, weird. At my school, when we make a mistake, sometimes we say sorry, right? But other times, we have to do something. We call it restorative, right? Restorative practices. Do any of you do that at your school? Awesome. So what that means is after a while, if we say sorry, and I was taught to say sorry all the time, right? When I was uh, growing up, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry, 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 sorry. Happens all the time. In a way, we need to practice fixing what we did, right? Would you agree with that? Okay. So it might be small scale, like uh, on the playground, you run into somebody like I ran into James. He's my partner. Don't worry, he'll be fine, okay? <laughs> He's tough. <laughs> if you ran into somebody on the playground, instead of just saying sorry, what's something you could do to repair that harm. What do you think? You could, you could ask if they're okay, and if they're not, you could like go get a teacher to see if they can help. 
Awesome. You could ask, are you okay, right? And then what do you need to help you get back? What if you are at school or your job or whatever and you say something mean on accident to somebody? What's something you could do other than saying sorry? Yeah, Evan? You could say, I didn't mean it. Cool. And if they said, what if you did mean it? What would you do next? Mm. Would you keep talking about it maybe and figure out maybe why you said that? Yeah, that makes a good sense, right? Sometimes the problems can be so big that we have to try something other than sorry as well, right? So what if it was maybe not even a problem that we feel like that we had a part of? Like, I don't know, there's people who are experiencing homelessness, homelessness, what could we do to repair that harm? Any thoughts? Yeah, Cora? We could set up a donation to help them, like, to help them so that they're not homeless. That'd be great, or maybe some way to provide housing like we do here, right? What if it's even bigger problem, and it's been going on for so, so long? Like, I don't know, a certain group of people is not able to get money or wealth or even homes in the same way as another group of people. Miss Erin, is there a way that we could, I don't know, help them by doing something? Well, I think it would be really important to be in relationship with those folks first before I try to solve problems for them, right? I want to make sure I have their input first and then, ask, like you said, ask what they need. Um, and also maybe learn about how that problem or how that system came to be. And then maybe see where I'm helping support that system. Yeah. And then maybe trying to make some different choices, if I can. And then talking to other people, too, about other choices that they've made. Yeah. So it's sort of like what Evan said, right? You have to have a big conversation sometimes to have that repair happen somewhere, right? Repair, reparation, something like that. Awesome. Thank you guys for talking to me today about how you can fix a problem instead of just saying sorry. Sorry, I took so much of your time. <laughs> All right, guys, let's sing our friends out. That's better. <laughs> Would you please rise in body and or spirit and join me in singing out of the teal hymnal number 1020, Wo Ya Ya. And the words are also behind me on the screens. We are going, heaven knows where we are going. No.
Buenos dias. Uh, I am a worker with Bayot Enterprises and have been since the pandemic actually began. Uh, it was the first time in quite some time that I was actually fully employed in about 20 years. And I've been a part of this congregation for almost a quarter century. So that's a fundamental uh, achievement, actually. And they work with people like myself with uh, serious disabilities. Uh, mine having to do with social connections. Um, I am honored to introduce uh, Sarah McCarthy, a program writer for our, our organization. And um, we employ about 5,000 people. My goal is to increase that to over 10,000 people in the next five years. I didn't tell the executive director, who's a very close friend of mine, that that's my goal, but I did figure I'd announce it publicly this morning. <laughs> if you're making a contribution to our organization, as it says on the back of this uh, wonderful paper, you can do it to Breeze. Uh, online, or you can write a check. Uh, but as far as I'm concerned, uh, there are no uh, better employment models, and I know many of them, uh, because I work in this capacity in the entire metro area and throughout the state, um, than uh, Bayot Enterprises. So without further ado, Mary, I mean Sarah, <laughs> excuse me, um, thank you. Thanks, Randall. Oh, um, I believe I've known Randall for a quarter of a century, um, meeting first at city council meetings. My name's Sarah McCarthy. I'm the grant and business proposal writer for Bayad Enterprises. We've, the organization has been around since 1969 when Fort Logan Mental Health Center started releasing chronically mentally ill to central Denver, but without anything to do. And a group of folks at um, Fort Logan put together a program to try to find something for folks to do and found that work was the most stabilizing influence. Um, the anecdotally and studies say that in the first two years that Bayot operated, um, we worked with about two dozen people and only one person in those two years needed rehospitalization for 24 hours. So Bayad since has um, included working with um, adults and families with other disabilities um, and now has expanded to working with homeless um, folks rebuilding um, from past incarceration or addictions. As Randall indicated, we serve about um, 5,000 people a year um, in a variety of capacities. Our foundational to our mission is employment, but we recognize that there will always be a portion of our population for whom a 40-hour work week is not feasible. So we, our aim is for people to achieve self-sufficiency based on their definition. We look to hire folks rebuilding from homelessness and um, the, the other barriers to employment um, by providing day labor opportunities and temporary jobs that we call transitional work experience. So we begin by getting people employed in their now job and while they are working in that now job, we provide supportive services to identify what might be their next job and put them on the path to their dream job. 
so that they achieve over a period of time um, self-sufficiency and um, participate in the mainstream of life. Um, we have employment programs, um, supported employment programs, working with more than 100 adults with um, significant disabilities, um, as well as hiring um, some, in 2021, we hired more than 375 people. 113 of them had been um, homeless in the past year, and we are amazed ourselves that 86% of those folks who were hired out of homelessness maintained that job or retained that job for six months or longer. And the goal is to keep people employed long enough for them to be able to stay on that path of sustainability to secure housing um, for themselves and their family. I ask you to be generous as the grant writer for the organization. We're always looking for funding. As Randall says that we continue to expand our programming. We're known as an innovator in employment programs in the metro area and in some places nationally. Um, putting people to work who have been either chronically unemployed or underemployed. Um, so think generously. I'm going to stay and join you at your coffee hour um, afterwards and welcome questions um, and challenges. So thank you for your time and attention and whatever folks may contribute. Thank you. do it if I don't sick and tired of being sick and tired this ain't heaven help us this ain't my word might get me fired this ain't heaven help us what a terrifying time to raise our voices this ain't heaven help us I'm not left with many more choices. This ain't heaven, help us. I got to put, put it, it into action. 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 Doing it A to Z until I set myself free. Action. 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 I don't care if you refuse to see. I got to put it into action. 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 Consider this a sign of an emergency. Action. 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 Who's going to do it if I don't do it? So my brains, so my brains are filled with fear. This ain't heaven, help us. So I feel the heat as night comes near. This ain't heaven, help us. Oh, A-C-T-I-O-N. This ain't heaven, help us. Please don't stop if you're really my friend. This ain't heaven, help us. I got to put it into action, action, action. action. Do it. sign of an emergency action 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 who's gonna do it if i don't do it i'm tired of being scared, I'm, tired of being scared. I'm so tired of being scared i'm so tired of all my children i'm scared for my children i'm tired of being scared for the mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. C-T-I-N-G. God share the truth that's inside of me. This is an emergency. Of the highest and the fullest and the final degree. I'm still trying to be free. Don't let this separate you and me. Oh, please. Who's going to do it if I don't do it? Into action. 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 Do it. Action, action, action. action.
I don't care if you refuse to see. I got to put it into action. 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 Consider this a sign of an emergency. Action. 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 Who's going to do it if I don't? morning freely given are gratefully received thank you for your generosity thank you for your support of Bayot Enterprises and the great work they do out there in the community thank you uh, I want to take just a moment and hold up our caring team uh, some of you know because some of you were there uh, last Wednesday they held a luncheon for all of our elders or folks over 80 years old it was a lovely event and a lot of people put in a lot of work to make that happen if you're part of the caring team would you just stand up so we can acknowledge and thank you for all the work you do for our community I have a number of uh, joys and concerns I'd like to share with you this morning. Uh, I want to hold up that Aaron and Jason Kenworthy are celebrating 13 years of marriage this week. And if you think that's impressive, Corey and Jan DeVore this very day are celebrating 51 years of being together. <laughs> I want to let you know that Ron Ivans McCleary has been diagnosed with leukemia and will begin chemotherapy this month. Uh, we send Don and Ron our love and support as they go through that and hope for a good outcome. Nancy Crow has been hospitalized for almost two weeks now. After much testing, they finally found a diagnosis uh, and Nancy has been dealing with West Nile virus. She is uh, doing better, but still experiencing uh, some paralysis in her legs. She will be at Spalding Rehabilitation Center for the indeterminate future. And Mark is setting up a sign up, some kind of online sign up uh, to uh, manage visits for her. Uh, we will publish that information when we get it. But please hold Nancy and Mark in your thoughts and prayers. Elisa Erickson had a fall at work and fractured her tibia. She tells me she's not in pain, uh, but she finds the crutches very frustrating. Lila Lowe had surgery uh, a little over two weeks ago and is now home from the hospital. Her daughter is staying with her, and uh, we hope that she is back to her active and energetic self as soon as possible. Steve Kaminer has now received three chemotherapy treatments so far for his diagnosis, and we send him and Joyce our love and support and our deepest hopes for a remission. And lastly, I, wanna, I just want to give a shout out. I do this periodically because it just, I think, needs to be done. I want to give a shout out and blessing to all those among us who deal with conditions and with illnesses that cannot be readily seen. Those, all those things that are basically invisible. I mean depression and anxiety and fear and despair, chronic pain or fatigue, neuropathy, Crohn's disease and all of its variants, arthritis and joints that don't work right, migraines, loneliness and isolation. There are a lot of heavy, heavy burdens out there that cannot be seen with the casual eye. If you are someone who carries one of these invisible burdens, you are not broken. You are not imagining anything. You are strong and you are resilient in ways most people will never know or understand. You are a warrior. Our prayer today was written by Danny Brick and uh, that's all I really know about Danny Brick, is that he wrote these words. I know, I know, if you could go back, you would walk with Jesus. 
you would march with King, maybe assassinate Hitler, at least hide Jews in your basement, it would all be clear to you. But people then, just like you, were baffled and had bills to pay and children they didn't understand and they too were so desperate for normalcy they made anything normal. Even turning everything inside out, even killing and killing and it's easy for turning the other cheek to be looking the other way, for walking to be talking and they hid in their houses and watched it on television when they had television and wrung their hands or didn't and your hands are just like theirs, lined, permeable, small, and you would follow Caesar and quote McCarthy and Hoover, and you would want to make Germany great again because you're afraid, and your parents are sick, and your job pays nothing, and where's your dignity? Just a little dignity in those kids down on the highway chaining themselves to buildings? What's their problem? And that kid, that's King. And this is Selma and Berlin and Jerusalem. And now is when they need you to be brave. Now is when they need you to go back and forget everything you know and give up the things you're chained to and make it look so easy in your grandkids' history books. They should still have them. Now is when it will all be clear to them. Amen. See how the flags are flying, reparations is a must. While the old ways are quickly dying, reparations is a must. And the fireworks in the night sky, tomorrow's poison dust. Parades across the nation. Ooh, reparations is a must. Ah. Statues and the glory. Reparations, reparations is a must. The story behind the story. Reparations, reparations is a must. All the children in their classrooms and the teachers are asked to trust can write it on the whiteboard Ooh, Ooh reparations, reparations is a must Ah Through every park and byway Reparations, reparations is a must through every crowd that blocks the highway Reparations is a must And the good word from the news team Work it out or bust And the wind that shakes the barley Ooh, reparations is a must Ah and clam bakes Reparations is a must Through the laughter and the milkshakes Reparations is a must And the sun burns on the front porch No time to fight a fuss You all know what to do now Oh, reparations is a must footsteps, elevate our gaze, clear our path, and find another way. Throughout the halls of power, 
Reparations is a must. The song grows by the hour. Reparations is a must. But if they can't sing and they won't dance, it was never meant for us. But if the, the, the party, oh, oh, reparations is a must. is a must just grab a map and wander reparations, reparations is a must if you listen you'll hear clearly it was never meant for us you sing this land is your land oh, reparations is a must is a must Ooh. Oh, reparations is a must Yeah, yeah, yeah Oh, reparations is a Good morning. I want to thank you so much for inviting me to speak to you today about a topic that you've been exploring now for a while, a scary topic, reparations. I want to say I really appreciate FUSD's willingness to work toward repair and consider moving toward racial justice in an even deeper way. I also appreciate your bravery in discussing, just getting right in there, including the entire service today dedicated to repair. My name is Lottie Liebdula, and I'm a retired financial strategist. I'm also a reparationist, a person dedicated to repairing the systems and structures that are broken in this country. Systems that allow white people like me and like many of you to prosper while many black families are held back. Systems that Reverend Mike described in detail in a previous sermon, and I know many of you have been exploring these things. Now, <clears throat> I'm not the usual suspect you might expect to take on this sort of work, not at all. For most of my life, I've considered myself to be a fiscal conservative person who believed that each of us has an equal chance at reaping the rewards of our hard work. All you need is a little gumption and elbow grease. Yeah. How many of you were raised with these values? Ah, looks like all of us, right? I think all of us have been raised this way, and these are the basic tenets of the American dream, aren't they? Well, a number of events, however, led me to a journey of discovery that culminated in my commitment to repair and changed my life in ways I could not begin to imagine. The first was actually moving to this very neighborhood in 2016. I'm your neighbor. I live close, to just about a mile from here near the tattered cover bookstore right down the street from Julie Myers, one of your congregants. Now, we live in a beautiful, beautiful neighborhood, don't we? Um, Tree-lined streets, beautiful Victorian homes, parks in any direction you might want to walk, the botanic gardens. Well, my husband and I moved here in 2016 from the West Highlands neighborhood, more modest area where we had lived for about 10 years. Now, our first Christmas there was <clears throat> a real adventure. We were rebuilding a bombed out 1890 Denver Square about to fall over. There was drywall dust all over. We still had boxes to unpack. It was a mess. It was kind of depressing. It was also snowing and our heater wasn't working right. 
<clears throat> and I happened to look out the window, imagining how could I escape from this. And I saw a commotion at the end of the street. It was a wedding procession. At the head were the bride and groom, followed by a New Orleans-style brass band and a throng of happy congregants, celebrants. We couldn't help ourselves. We dashed outside, scrambled down the street in the snow to check out the procession. And we ended up in our neighbor's kitchen. The newlyweds were two young attorneys, one black, one white, who had just moved in. We discovered a common, we kind of interrupted the whole thing, it was kind of rude, but we had so much fun. <laughs> we discovered a common love of music, an evil sense of humor, and a love of bold and very silly conversation that would propel a decade of raucous get-togethers. Another thing we had in common, after working hard to build businesses and renovate our homes, we both decided to move out of the neighborhood at the 10-year mark. Now, I had just inherited after the death of my mother, and my husband and I decided to move one last time to Congress Park and our dream neighborhood. Now, our friends were much younger, and they were struggling to pay down their student debt and establish their, their law practice. And, you know, they, they really couldn't afford their mortgage anymore, and so they downsized and moved to Elyria, Swansea. One day after our moves, I happily called my African-American neighbor just to compare, compare notes. Hey, how are we both doing? I said, you know, our new house is just great. Today I've been driving around Congress Park, admiring the great trees, meeting really cool neighbors, including some of you here. Um, and you know me, listening to NPR. <clears throat> it just feels like all is right with the world. I feel right at home, maybe for the first time. My old neighbor paused, and then she said, you know, I've also been driving around my new neighborhood today, and I'm also listening to NPR. But this neighborhood has no trees. It's dusty, it's pretty hot here. There isn't a park near my house, just the freeway. And frankly, I've been feeling anxious. The voices on NPR don't speak to my reality at all. After I hung up the phone, I felt disquieted. How could my reality be so different from my African-American neighbors? After all, she was a highly educated attorney and a business owner just like me. We had gone to concerts together. We had lived similar lives for 10 years. Our experiences should be equivalent, or so I thought. Now, I happened to have a meeting with a black colleague that afternoon. She became agitated when I reported the conversation with my neighbor. Oh, Lottie, please. There is no equivalency. Every part of the world you inhabit is set up, set up to benefit you and others who look just like you. Now, I had never engaged in a conversation like that before, and I just shrugged my shoulders, and that really started it. Don't insult me. Don't pretend you don't know. You know exactly how these systems work because your ancestors designed them, and you continue to reap the benefits. Well, my colleague was clearly angry, so I quickly nodded in agreement to maybe quit the conversation, but later had to admit to myself that I had no idea how these systems worked or exactly what benefits I had received. Hadn't I earned everything through hard work, all those 12-hour days? What systems were we talking about anyway? Again, I had grown up believing in the bootstrap argument that the playing field is level and that anyone who works hard will reap, reap the good results. And, and it, this is a value that's been passed down in my family from hardworking forebears for many generations. I'm sure that's true of many of you too. I'd also inherited from my family the value of charity or even noblesse oblige. The idea that since I worked so hard and I've been blessed with prosperity, that I should share my blessing with those who are less fortunate. How many of us here say this phrase regularly? We're just so blessed. Well, surely the ancestors who provided this moral framework had built system that were fair, systems that were fair and just. I, I was sure of it. I mean, I don't know about you, but I grew up hearing about my ancestors in the most glowing terms possible. 
I learned that I was a proud descendant of Colorado pioneers, that I was a descendant of true patriots, the very founders of this country, as well as immigrants who came here with nothing but the shirts on their backs in search of the American dream. My ancestors had been civic leaders and supporters of the arts for many generations. Fine people, I'm sure. But as I thought more about these conversations, I decided I need to know more about these ancestors, really so I could defend my heritage. You know, I was, just, I was getting nervous here. The mantle of being the family historian had been passed to me with my mother's death, so I began the really fun process of going through 30 boxes of family ephemera. Now, this was a process I was dreading, but I was excited to learn more about my, my ancestors who my mother had described so glowingly. One box looked older than the rest, so I decided I'll start with that one. It looked like it hadn't been opened in maybe 100 years. Inside, I discovered a little black book. I was just delighted to, to find that it belonged to my second great-grandfather, William Hayes Paxton. Now, as I paged through the book, I noticed the perfect penmanship and the neat rows of figures. You know, I had often wondered, how does a finance person get born into a cultural arts family? I immediately felt a sense of kinship with my second great-grandfather as I paged through his business ledger. So, this is where I got my business sense from. I felt proud. But as I paged through the ledger and saw references to lists of tools and then bales of cotton, I realized this was not any business ledger. This was a ledger documenting my second great-grandfather's plantation operations. As I came to pages 27 through 30, I stopped cold. The pages were titled, Loss of Slaves by War, 1861 through 1865. In it were listed the names, ages, and values of people my ancestors had enslaved in the Mississippi Delta. People like Israel Gillespie and his mother Dinah, Israel's wife, Julia, and their infant son, William. I later found the memoir of A.J. Paxton, William's brother, who provided detailed descriptions of their lives through the Civil War and their very disturbing views on slavery and states' rights. States' rights. The existence of the ledger and the contents of the memoir did not comport with the stories that had been told about my heritage, in fact, I began experiencing the same feeling of disconnect exploring my family history that I'd had with my neighbor as we explored our divergent experiences of our own conditions today. Now, I know many of you may have had similar experiences, similar conversations. Some of you know exactly how this feels. You also know the questions that come next. If I didn't know about this history. What else do I not know about? Or even worse, what if my family's version of history is skewed? What if our entire origin story is skewed? So I set out to research my ancestry in parallel with U.S. history to see if I might reconstruct a family history that jived with the stories my black and brown colleagues were reporting. Now, we'll be here all night. This is a sleepover. You brought your pajamas, I hope? Yeah? <laughs> Reverend Mike didn't tell you? <laughs> okay, just kidding. Well, long story short, um, while I began my research, hoping to defend my family's honor, what I found began the process of removing the blindfold from my eyes. I traced back 10 generations of my family along 16 separate branches. These included German and Norwegian immigrants who arrived here in the late 1800s, as well as English, Scots-Irish, French, and Dutch immigrants who arrived here the, from the 1600s through the 1700s. I found Northerners and Southerners, farmers, teachers, ministers, miners, doctors and lawyers, civil servants. I also found Catholics and Protestants, Lutherans and Quakers. I might even have one Jewish ancestor. Shh, it's a secret. In short, my family's history is the typical American story. Immigrants escaping brutal conditions in their homelands, coming here to pursue the American dream. Through grit, through hard work. But what's become clear to me is this. Though my ancestors surely worked hard, 
They also received many economic benefits just because of our white skin. Benefits my black colleagues' ancestors never received. Benefits that are still accruing interest today. Many generations of my ancestors received land grants through the Homestead Acts, programs that gave immigrants, <coughs> Americans, land if they agreed to build on that land and cultivate it as the country pushed west. <clears throat> land that was mostly seized from Native Americans, of course. That's an entirely different talk. Now, 10% of the land of this country was provided to 1.6 million homesteaders, and 98% of those were white. Even my German and Norwegian ancestors received land. In 1885, my Norwegian Halverson ancestors in Wisconsin received 160 acres after arriving in this country only 10 years prior. Now, I know this because I've looked it up on the Bureau of Land Management's website. Any of you can do that. You just put in a last name, a state, and it all pops up. There it is. Now, these newcomers were considered effectively more American than emancipated slaves, whose families may have been here for hundreds of years. My English and Scots-Irish ancestors received land as early as the 1660s and as late as the 1850s and used the free land to establish plantations in the South. They earned their wealth through hard work. Oh, and not having to pay wages to the people they enslaved. For instance, my Paxton ancestors, all renowned attorneys, attended law school in Virginia in the early 19th century, likely funded by plantation proceeds. The next generations ran law practices in parallel with their cotton plantations in the Mississippi Delta and passed down that wealth to subsequent generations. You know, by the turn of the century, most branches of my family were prosperous and well-educated, owning both land and homes and attending their region's best schools. Now, that includes my, my great-grandfather, C.C. Welch, an early Colorado pioneer. <clears throat> he arrived here in 1860 and founded this area's coal mining industry. He was elected territorial legislator in 1871, representing Jefferson County before Colorado was a state. The first legislation he brought forward was the founding of the Colorado School of Mines. Boy, was I proud. I grew up hearing all about this. Very proud of that. Where did his wealth come? Sure, hard work and those land grants, more than 30 of them. One of the parcels is a tree grant park, and you can still visit it near Golden today. Now, he was also, he was basically an early real estate investor. He would meet the minimum requirements to obtain tracks in Golden and then sell the parcels. One of these parcels was sold to a young German immigrant hoping to start a brewery. That would be Adolf Coors. C.C. Welch lived at 14th and Washington, right in this neighborhood, seven blocks from here. His daughter, Jean, that's my grandmother, she went to Miss Walcott's finishing school across the street. Now, I must say in doing this research, I've become much more daring. I like to compare notes with my black colleagues. And funny thing, now that I've done some research on my family's history, our stories are beginning to converge. For instance, it's clear to me that land and slavery provided the basis for much of my ancestors' wealth and subsequent generations' education as well. And I love to ask whether my black colleagues' ancestors also received free land. It's a trick question, though. Statistically, just 2% of emancipated Africans applied for and received these grants, and only after 1866. Now, even if my black colleagues' ancestors are in that 2%, it's likely that their ancestors lost the land. You see, my family had another advantage. When it comes to the transfer of wealth, our legal training gives us the ability to draft wills so that our future heirs don't have to go through probate. African Americans, on the other hand, <clears throat> have little access to legal services, nor do they trust white attorneys. Even by 1900, many are still illiterate since learning to read and write has been illegal since the slavery era. Many African Americans die without wills and their property becomes heirs' property, a situation in which all living relatives inherit the property together, but individuals retain the right to sell it without informing the other heirs. 
Since 1910, as much as 90% of black-owned land has been lost due to legal treachery as white developers and even local, state, and federal agencies dupe individual heirs or find legal loopholes to grab valuable heirs' property. Now, that doesn't even count the land lost due to the intimidation of black landholders by their neighbors, white farmers, and yes, KKK members. What I find when I ask <clears throat> is that many of my black colleagues have not only grown up with these stories of ancestral land loss, some continue to face heirs' property losses even today. It's happening now. By 1900, the economic advantages white people like my ancestors have over black people are nearly insurmountable, literally baked into our economic system. And the benefits continue to accrue. Later generations of white families have access to programs like Social Security, FHA loans, and the GI Bill, which allow us to afford college educations, buy houses, and start businesses. Again, many black people are legislated out of receiving the majority of these benefits. With the GI Bill, for instance, my father <clears throat> returns from World War II and is able to attend film school at UCLA, guaranteeing him access to work as a cinematographer in Hollywood. African Americans are either denied access to these same benefits outright or receive substandard access. They attend underfunded programs in segregated schools. The result, as many studies have revealed, and as uh, Reverend Mike mentioned in his last sermon, the racial wealth gap is currently 10 to 1 because of these inequities. The wealth gap is reflected everywhere we choose to look. It's reflected right here in this neighborhood, right here in this congregation, right here in my, my very body, if we just choose to open our eyes and look. We stand at a moral crossroads today. The inequities that are baked, in, baked into our economy, our social structures, our neighbors, neighborhoods, continue to cause damage. Study after study confirms that racism is even impacting our GDP, holding this country back from economic prosperity. That affects each one of us, each one of us. Now, we are not our ancestors. We did not cause the problems of the past but we continue to benefit from the inequitable pol policies of the past. However, each of us holds a key to repairing this damage. Each of us can stand up and be accountable for repairing the harm our collective families have caused. This is not easy work to do, as you all know. The good news is that congregations all over the U.S. are beginning to engage in direct repair. Many have studied their faith's history using a racial justice lens, as FUSD is beginning to do and has been doing. <clears throat> then they've looked inward to see if the congregation itself, the local body itself, has engaged in harm requiring redress. UU churches in particular are becoming deeply engaged in the work of repair, just as FUSD continues to do. For instance, Widening the Circle of Concern, a UU publication that came out in 2020, just two years ago, analyzes structural racism and white supremacy culture within the UUU faith and makes recommendations to advance long-term change <clears throat> to preserve and develop the ideals of Unitarian Universalism, to redeem them. Other faith communities have pushed even further and have joined the movement for reparations launching programs that seek to rectify specific harms local black communities have experienced. Some of these churches were literally built by enslaved people. Other churches may have participated in racist neighborhood covenants, which kept black people out of the neighborhood. Our neighborhood is such a neighborhood. Others may simply have been unwelcoming to congregants who weren't white. History that is uncovered can be repaired. Again, this is not an easy path, but there are tools available to support the work. In 2019, I, I founded a portal called Reparations for Slavery for white families wishing to walk the path of repair, the path of racial healing through engaging in direct repair. On this platform, white families learn about US history that's essentially been erased from our textbooks and learn techniques for connecting this history to our own ancestry. 
Now, for me, this, this history has been incredibly painful to discover. <clears throat> As I've discovered that even the stories my mother told me are essentially not true. But I can now tell my family's story in a way that empowers black people to tell their own family stories. And our narratives are beginning <clears throat> to align. Removing these blinders has also hardened my resolve to engage in repair, to become a modern-day abolitionist. When people ask me if I feel guilty when I discover hard truths about my family's past, I say no. I am transforming guilt and shame into reparative action. And I'm transforming my family's traditional value of noblesse oblige into a commitment to engaging in direct repair. I have joined with others in the Denver community to found Reparations Circle Denver, a giving circle of the Denver Foundation, which works with the Denver Black Reparations Council to walk the path of repair, to walk our talk. Three members of your congregation are also founders. The family plan of repair I've mapped out helps me specifically address some of the harms my own family has caused. There are some very specific things that I can, I can heal just looking at my family's history. I'm applying my agency, my time, and my resources to enact that plan. And this congregation can follow the footsteps of other congregations that are also engaging in repair. Ultimately, despite our differences, what knits all of us together is our pursuit of that elusive American dream. However, buying into the American dream is no different than buying into a business. The balance sheet contains both assets and liabilities. As somebody who may have inherited my finance and legal skills from a slave-holding ancestor, I can tell you the liability for engaging in 400 years of systemic racism has now come due. Thank you. Would you please rise and body and or spirit and join me in singing a song that's new to many of us. It's called, I'm Gonna Lift My Sister Up. The words will be behind me on the screens. I'll sing, I'll sing a little bit and I, you just jump in whenever you're up for it. I'm gonna lift my sister up, she is not heavy, and that's the basic. I'm gonna lift my sister up, she is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my sister up, she is not heavy. If I don't lift her up, I will fall down. My brother up. I'm gonna lift my brother up. She is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my brother up. He is not heavy. I'm gonna lift my brother up. He is not heavy. If I don't lift him up, I will fall down. I'm gonna lift my people up, they are not heavy. I'm gonna lift my people up, they are not heavy. I'm gonna lift my people up, they are not heavy. If I don't lift them up, I will fall down. I'm gonna 
If I don't lift us up, if I don't lift us up, one more time, if I don't lift us up, if I don't lift us up, I will fall down. Please join me in singing our closing affirmation, after which will be the benediction. Behind all our differences and beneath our diversity, there is a unity that makes us one, binds us forever together throughout all time, life and death, and the space. benediction today and thank you for your sharing your thoughts today our benediction today is a few quotes from the great American James Baldwin people are trapped in history and history is trapped in them those who say it can't be done are usually interrupted by others who are doing it I imagine one of the reasons people cling to their hates so stubbornly is because they sense that once hate is gone, they will be forced to deal with pain. I love America more than any other country in this world, and exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they have never failed to imitate them. And I'll finish with this one. Nothing is more desirable than to be released from an affliction, but nothing is more frightening than to be divested of a crutch. Our service is ended. Go in peace. <laughs>